good evening, fellow citizens of the household of God. This is Wednesday night Bible study. Zechariah chapter 10 is where we are. I pray that you'll take these next few moments to grab pen, paper, Bibles, and get ready for a powerful word from the Lord. If, if, if I can just tell you what um, the focus is tonight, it's redeemed. And that is always such a wonderful discussion because we need to know that through Christ we are redeemed. So, again, grab paper, pen, Bibles, get ready for a powerful word from the Lord. We will open with a word of prayer and then jump right into Zechariah chapter 10. So let us pray. Father, we thank you. We bless you. God, we ask you for forgiveness of all sin. Sins of the mind, sins of the body, sins of the spirit, God. Wash us clean. Wash our ears, wash our minds, wash our hearts, that they would be acceptable unto you, God. Set us before you that you may consume us with your mighty fire, burning out those things which are not like you, helping us to become more and more like you, closer to you, in greater relationship with you. Father, I pray for each listener that their ears would be anointed to hear your word as you speak unto them in their lives and their situation. Then God, anoint my mouth that I may speak only what you say. In Jesus' name we pray. Those who agree say, amen. God bless all of you. Good to see you, sweet babies. Keevan, Sylvie, love you too. All right, Zechariah chapter 10. The focus tonight is redeemed. And as we get there, we're going to look at some of the things that got us in a condition of being rejected. But as we get to look at being redeemed, redeemed is such a wonderful condition. Redeemed is gain or regain possession of, recover, retrieve, do something that compensates for poor past performance or behavior. And it was God who did something, which what he did was forgave us. He provided a way of escape. He provided salvation. He applied grace. Save from sin or error or evil through grace accepted sacrifice. Now, that gave you more of an understanding of redeem. Let's look at verse one. Ask ye of the Lord, rain in the time of the latter rain, so the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to everyone, grass in the field. Rain in grass to us is prosperity, part of the redeemed package. If you'll notice, when he sends the rain, it gives the grass. Well, that's not the end of it. You need to understand the focus behind the rain to increase the grass, the grass to feed the animals, the animals to feed the people, the people to get fat and to have nourishment and to have currency because you know they dealt in animal trade back then. And so part of the look of prosperity then so that people knew you were a child of God is if your numbers increased, your livestock increased, and the children of Israel grew beyond counting. Some people wanted to come along and count them. God, I didn't tell you to do that. Don't do that. That number multiplied because of God's provision. Let's look at verse two. For the idols have spoken vanity 
and the diviners have seen a lie and have told false dreams. They comfort in vain, therefore, they went their way as a flock. They were troubled because there was no shepherd. That told us right there, just in verse two, told us how we got in the condition of being separated from God, how we got in the condition of being rejected of God, how we got in the condition of walking alone in the wilderness, how we got in the condition of where we needed to be redeemed, how we've listened far too long to idolatrous preachers who see and hear lies and we accept it. When we repent, we are to separate from the song and dance, false teaching, only having the mass numbers through deceit groups. And get in truth of God. We are responsible as an individual servant of God. Please take this personally. As an individual in God, you are responsible for your own salvation. What you're saying, Bishop, work out your own salvation. How, with fear and trembling, what does that look like? That looks like I get in the word and I believe God. I get in the word and I study his word to find out how he wants me to love him. It's time out for us telling God how we think he wants to be loved. And we need to start looking at his word because it tells us specifically how he wants to be loved. And yes, for those of you who would go in the word and read something different applied to you, that is the purpose of each individual studying to show thyself approved unto God. Because you may not be able to extract the same information out of the word that I can. But what you can, you will better understand because it's for you. We've listened to lies far too long. Not for what a ministry. You, 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 listen, so many people go to these churches because of what the ministry can do for them. Didn't Christ do enough? He gave it life for some he didn't do. Wrongly accused, sentenced to death and had no faults. Wasn't that enough? But no, you got to get the biggest bang for your buck. It is supposed to be what we bring to God, which is all of us, our total being. But a lot of us visit, and when we do, we may be there in the physical, but the mental is not. We may be there in the physical, but the financial is not. We may be there in the physical, but the love is not. We may be there in the physical, but the obedience stayed outside the door. What you mean, sir? It's real simple. When you go into the house of God, you're going to God's house. Now, I can understand if you are confused when the name of the house that you're going to is somebody else's name. I get that. I ain't talking about them. When you go to God's house, I can just talk about me. When it came time to uh, put, if you will, a name on the church, God gave me the name, Ephesians 2. He took me to scripture and he said, ye are no longer foreigners, but fellow citizens and with the saints and of the household of God. So that name, fellow citizens of the household of God, it's God's house, not mine. This ain't John Wayne's ministries. But we seek out these places that teach 
how we want to live, what we want to hear. We don't want to go to these churches that would teach against our lifestyle. See, there are, there are a lot of churches right now teaching people that if you are in a group of folk and they're not doing something to better themselves, to get rich, to get, you're in the wrong group. What happened to being in a group of people who are seeking to do God's will? What happened to that? We focus too much and all of it has to do with idolatry. All of it has to do with lies and deceit. All of it has to do with living in the world and the world in us. God delivered us from Egypt. How is it that we turn so quickly and go back and be consumed by it? If you want to see the, 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 the biggest parallel, look at Egypt and the world. God took the children of Israel out of Egypt, delivered them out of bondage. But they took Egypt with them in their hearts. God delivered us out of the world. But we took the world in our hearts. We can't come to God for a relationship telling him what type of relationship he wants. You can't tell God how he wants to be loved. Let's go to Isaiah 119. Then Psalms 51, 17. Then 1 Samuel 15, 22. I'll repeat that. Isaiah 119. Psalms 51, 17. 1 Samuel 15, 22. That is just in case I skip over and forget to tell you where I'm reading from. Now, let's look at. Isaiah 119, if ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. If that ain't simple, I don't know what else to tell you. If you be willing and obedient, willing to separate yourself from the world and obedient to the life that I've planned for you. I know my plans towards you that I think toward you. I know my thoughts I think towards you. But you, you can translate thoughts as plans. I know my plans for you. Plans of peace and not of war. With an expected end. Victory. Hmm. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. You, you don't have to go to nobody for help. God got you. See, some of us are looking to other people for a handout or for help or for uh, sustainment. We should be looking only to God. I'm talking what I'm living. God don't let me talk what I don't live. He puts it to me every time. And my total trust is in him. Not man because man has failed me so many times and have been so disappointing. Absolutely. To this day. It's a constant battle. Why? Because man is hard-headed. Man does what man want to do and don't think there's nothing nobody can do about it. And then when they get in trouble and they get set outside of God's presence and have to experience all of the things that were standing and waiting to attack them, that's what people don't get. There are things waiting for God to remove the hedge of protection from around you. And listen, it ain't that God removes it. It's you get out of it. So let's say that there's a perimeter here. And, and in order to stay in this perimeter, you get real close to it with your, with your rebellion at times and your disobedience, but you repent and you, you get back centered. You center yourself back in the will of God. When you get so far gone that you get outside of the circumference that God placed you in, in his ark of safety. You are now attacked by the enemy. You may not see it immediately. It may be a couple of months down the road. It may be attacking those whom you love. We need to be sure to stay in the will of God. If you be willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. Listen, Psalms 51, 17, the sacrifices of God 
or a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, thou wilt not despise. Broken, broken from self-motivated agendas. Broken and contrite heart. You separate yourself from all of those things which you hold as priority and you put God first. You put him first. You don't put anything before him. And people really have a problem with that because they can touch other people, but they can't touch God. So they put other people before God. You really need to check that. Check yourself. You, you can't do that. You shouldn't do that. We do it, but you shouldn't. The sacrifices of God, what God is looking for, how God wants to be loved. Are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. The Lord will not despise. First Samuel 15, 22. And Samuel said, had the Lord as great delight, listen, in burnt offering and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord. For those of you who might have gotten confused, let me go ahead and just clear this up with a little language translation. And Samuel said, had the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, or does he have a delight in obeying his voice? Behold, to obey is better than the sacrifice. And to hearken than the fat of rams. You should not think you know what's best for God. You shouldn't think that. You should not think that God will just accept what you're giving as being okay. Do you know how many times people give to God and God rejects what they're giving, but it still leaves their hand? But it doesn't go towards any reciprocating blessing. It just falls into empty space because you didn't give it with an unbridled heart and unbridled hands. You didn't give it with joy for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, let me help some of you. If that is a problem for you, you need to really go to God to understand if you want God in your finances. If you want God in your health. If you want God in the peace of your home. If you want God in where well, you've got to surrender it to him. You've got to be obedient with it as he says. In order for it to reap the benefits that God says. Uh, wh what are you saying? Yo, come on. We're not talking in circles. Understand me clearly. If you want God in your health, well, he has to be using you in order for him to be in charge of your health. Hello. That's simple. If you want God in your finances, you already know. If you're not in a back and forth relationship with God, I promise you, your side going to run out. God never runs out. But your side will. What you mean, Bishop? You can only take so much from the Lord before he cuts you off. Mm. Let's look at verse three. God is angry with the shepherds, the preachers, the leaders. So he punished the goats, the followers, the members of that shepherd. You can escape this punishment through true relationship. Surrender to God, not a man. Your surrenderance is to God. Your giving is to God. Your service is to God. Your relationship is to God, not to a man. Don't get confused. Man is the instrument being used of God. And if he's not used of God, you'll see it. You'll know it. 
Don't get fooled by the pomp and stance. Don't get fooled by the suits and the cars and the mansions and, and, and all the wonderful things that the ministry does for the community. Quit playing with me. I, I, I don't have an impact in the community. I, I don't. God has me teaching and preaching to the souls, not the community. The community stays here. It keeps going when the souls go on to see the Lord. And eventually the community is going to burn up. So all them buildings that's got your name on it and the brick that's got your name on it because you donated it, all of that's getting burnt up. It don't mean a thing. What did you do with the souls? Did you win souls? And when he says win souls, win souls for him, not for your ministry. Whether or not they attend your church or not, did you give them what thus saith the Lord and give them the correct path to get to God? Or did you tell them they got to come out of sin and come out of this and come out of that? Yes, they do have to come out of sin, but it is God who makes us holy. It is God who removes the desires when we want him to. Just because I want you to come out of sin, don't mean that when the doors close and the lights go off, you came out. But when I'm in the room, you ain't doing it. God sees everything. God is not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever shall a man sow it, that shall he also reap. You understand what you do in the dark. Folk gonna see your fruit in the light. Now we're going to end with verses 6 through 10, which will take us to the last point. This redemption will restore us to a true, pristine relationship as if we were never cast out of his presence. I want y'all to see this. Look at verse six. And I will strengthen the house of Judah and I will save the house of Joseph and I will bring them again. I want you to hear that. I will bring them again to place them. For I have mercy upon them, and they shall be as though I had not cast them off. For I am the Lord, their God, and will hear them. And they shall be as though I had not cast them off. You can get into the rotation of doing so much that God will let you stay in that rotation and just leave you there. Cast off. You just bullheaded. You just got to be reminded. Why? Don't nobody got to remind you about stuff you want to do. Why you got to be reminded about God? Why do you have to be made to do something? God gave that message one time. Y'all remember? He maketh me to lie down. Why do you have to be made to lie down? Because you're hard-headed. You're foolish. And your foolery is going to get you caught up in something you can't get out of. Once in true relationship, you begin to have, listen, he says deliverance from the sin that doth so easily beset us. We get deliverance from that. He said we get rescued from the holes of the oppressors in our life. Then he says we get to abide in a secret place. God puts us where we are protected and reserved. Get in true relationship and get your benefits back. Some of you are looking at the rain that you receive in your life. God reigns on the just as well as the unjust. As if, hey, thank you, God. As if you're in good standings with God. No, that's just that rain that he gives to all. You know whether or not you're in good standing. You know whether or not you are obedient. You know whether or not you're walking uprightly before. You know whether or not you're doing what is right before the Lord. You know. Please do not ever think that your service to God 
takes the pl hey, thank you takes the place of your relationship because it don't. Your service to God is service to God. Your relationship, though, is what God is looking at. Anybody can serve God. Anybody can do service. And listen, when I say service, I'm talking about what you do in the church. Anybody can do that. Anybody can sweep the floor. Anybody can wipe the toilet. I do that. I do the floor. I do the toilet. I do that before anybody gets there. Yeah. Set the atmosphere for the spirit of the Lord to welcome. Come on. You're welcome, Lord. Come on in. I set foot first. Why? Because the atmosphere gets set so that when the people of God come through the door, they should come in in a way you should enter his gates with thanksgiving, enter into his courts with praise. You should come in with a heart joyful and ready to worship with no distractions. There ain't going to be nothing there meeting you except the spirit of God. That's it. No foolishness, no drama. None of that. Don't ever take your service that you do as the replacement or the sustainer of relationship. No, God desires a relationship with us. He wants the whole heart, the whole mind, the whole body. He don't just want what your hands can offer. He wants all. You want all of him. You want all his blessings from glory. You want all it and you want and you want to go live with him, but you don't want to live for him. You want to live with him, but you don't want to live for him. How that going to work out? It ain't. Depart from me that work of iniquity. I know you're not. But under the conditions of redeemed, do you see the package that he's giving you? He's giving you deliverance, rescue and a secret place. I'll show you. All right. Let's look at verse eight. I will hiss for them and great and gather them for I have redeemed them and they shall increase as they have increased. And I will sow them among the people and they shall remember me in far countries and they shall live with their children and turn again. I will bring them again also out of the land of Egypt and gather them out of Assyria and I will bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon and a place shall not be found for them. Secret place. Rescued. He going to rescue us out of Egypt again. Out of get. Deliver us. He's doing all of that. Redeemed is such a wonderful place, such a wonderful atmosphere to be in with God because God takes you to a position of pristine, pristineness, where you are unspotted, you're spotless, you're unspoiled. He takes you back to your original format, the one that he created us to be, acceptable in his sight. Now, under that condition of being redeemed, it is your responsibility to maintain your relationship with God because it is you who get you out of his presence. It is you who takes you away from him. It's not him who removes himself from us. We were cast because of our decisions. What decisions are you making to remove yourself out of a redeemed place with God? Can you get redeemed each and every day? You should. Lord, help me to make better decisions. Help me to see clearly the deceit that I live in, deceiving only myself. Because you only deceive yourself. You don't deceive God. God knows your heart. God sees the purity of the heart. You're deceiving yourself to think that God is okay with what you're doing. You better stop. You can't tell God how he wants to be loved. You'll hear me say it many times that each person's journey is different. Absolutely. You can't take a blanket thing and put it all over everybody and say we're all the same. God didn't God did not want robots. He didn't. 
How, how do you know that, Bishop? Look at what he created first. He created Adam. Then he made a woman. If he wanted robots, he would have just made a whole bunch of atoms. And then when you look at our children that we produce, I saw something online earlier, Keevan posted, and it was a preacher doing an excerpt on train up a child. And his excerpt was the fact that we are to train a child in the way that he should go, not the way I want him to go. What's the difference? When we train our children, they might look like us, they might have our stature, they might, all of that, because God gave us DNA, but they still have an individual journey. And God is not looking for clones. God is looking for individuals who will say, for God I live and for God I'll die. I'll serve you, God. I give you me. We're not teaching our children. That's the training we need to get. Look to God for what direction he has for your life. What, what has God called you to do? What is God looking for you to contribute into this world? And it ain't going to all look the same because some of them will be CEOs. Some of them will be managers. Some of them will be lay workers. Some of them will be church folks. Some of them will be worldly folk. You mean God won't worry the folk? Some of them. The world got to be here. That don't mean they don't love God. Y'all got to stop telling God how he want to be loved. Stop. Those of you who have an ear to hear, let them hear. Hear what the Lord is saying to you. What is he telling you about your conditioning? What is he telling you about your journey, your walk? Are you still in the condition of being redeemed? Or have you been cast off? If you don't know and you cannot answer. You got to research. You got some work to do. When we get off tonight. Go into your prayer closet. Begin to talk to God. Ask him for revelation. God where do I stand with you? God am I still in your will? Thank you Holy Ghost. Or am I. <laughs> listen. Or am I a replica of the training I've received? See, I got a problem with training. God got me on this journey I'm on right now concerning this where I'm at. And he says, I have you going this way so that no man can put their thumb on you and say I made him. Nobody's made John Wayne. God did. All wisdom, all knowledge, all speak, everything I have. God did it. Can't nobody take credit for that. Nobody. That's my journey. I don't know what yours is. And I'm not that kind of preacher that's going to tell you, I can see you did it. You anointed to do. Uh-uh. Lord, you better tell them. Now, it's different if the Lord tell me to say something. And trust and believe if the Lord tell me to say something, I'm going to say what I'm supposed to say and move on. Because just because I can, God gives me a message to tell you that he has anointed you to preach, that don't mean you are my preacher, that you belong to me, that I need to, no, that ain't what that mean. I gave you what God told me to give you and I move on. So many don't want to move on, they want to hold on to people. They want to mold people. They want to mentor. Mm. God is the mentor, not you. Because when you get through mentoring, that person going to sound like you. If you hold your ear and cock your head to the left, they, to the right, they're going to do what you do. Redeemed by God is grace applied, salvation washed, God walking with us, providing a place of protection and we living according to his will for our life. That's redeemed. God bless you. Thank you. We will pick up with chapter 11. The title of chapter 11 says foolish shepherds. We're going to see. I believe God is talking to the preachers in chapter 11, but 
I don't want anybody to take away from that to think that he only talked to. No, he's talking to anybody who has any kind of position of leadership. And that could be a father, an uncle, a brother, a sister. It doesn't matter. If you have ever said anything to anybody that is instructional, it's talking to you as a shepherd. If you've ever stepped in the shoes of a shepherd, you said anything. No, take a right. Yeah, you told him what to do. All right. God bless you. We pray that your understanding and your grasping of the word of God be endowed with strength and spiritual wisdom that God will lead and guide you on your journey and your development in him in Jesus name. I love you. God bless you. Thank you. Join us Saturday at 1130 for Saturday morning service. It's a powerful word from God. That's all I can tell you, but I'm going to tell you right now. You don't want to miss it. God bless you. We love you and goodbye.